You know, we live in uh, the best country in the world. Uh, I want our country to support aspiration and to reward hard work, to take proper care of those Australians who short term or long term can't take care of themselves. We have a rich and proud Indigenous heritage and a migrant story, the envy of the world. We're aligned with countries of similar values. We always have been, and that alliance, as we know, is more important than ever. Our strength to the Australian people is as the best party to keep our country safe and to keep our economy strong so that we can afford to pay for the essential services. By the time of the next election in 2025, we will have presented a plan to the Australian people which will clean up Labor's inevitable mess and lay out our own vision. We won't be Labor light. We'll propose strong policy to make the lives of Australians better and to provide more security to them. Our policies will be squarely aimed at the forgotten Australians in the suburbs across regional Australia, the families and small businesses whose lot the Labor Party will have made more difficult. Under my leadership, the Liberal Party will be true to our values that have seen us win successive elections over the course of the last quarter of a century. Make no mistake, and Australians understand this, that the next three years under Labor is going to be tough for the Australian people. Already they're breaking promises and foreshadowing policy shifts. They weren't ready to govern, and we're already seeing their inexperience on, delay, on display. Susan and I lead a team which has the experience to make the right calls on supporting government policies that are in our national interest and standing against those that are not in our national interest. I want to acknowledge my predecessor, Scott Morrison, his wife, Jenny, and their girls for the enormous contribution they've made, not just to our country, but to the Liberal Party as well. And we wish them all the very best in the next stage of their life. I've held a marginal seat for two decades, and I know how to work with people and how to achieve outcomes for local communities. I know how to campaign. I've been the Assistant Treasurer to Peter Costello and held ministries in the Howard Abbott Turnbull and Morrison governments. I've served on the National Security Committee and the Expenditure Review Committee and the Leadership Group in two governments. My greatest honour was to represent the men and women of the Australian Defence Force, the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian Cyber Security Centre, the Australian Federal Police, ASIO, the Australian Border Force and Austrac. And I grew up in a working class suburb with two loving parents who were hard working, small business people. My parents worked hard for every dollar and we weren't financially well off. I started part-time work in a butcher in a butcher shop after school and until I started university. I saved and bought a house at 19 and built a business from nothing to ultimately employ 40 people. I was a police officer for 10 years and I've dedicated my working life to public service and I'm passionate about the protection of children and women, particularly the protection against sexual assault and harassment. I owe everything, of course, to my family, to my friends, to my community, and of course, the Liberal Party and my colleagues for the incredible honour to be standing here with you today. As Prime Minister, you need strength of character and a relentless resolve to see our country through the good and the bad times. They are among the character traits that I bring to this job. Susan, I'll hand over to you, and then we're happy to take some questions. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Can I thank the Liberal Party Room for the great honour of being elected Deputy Leader? Can I thank my electorate of Farrah for returning me eight times to this federal parliament, the wonderful people from Western New South Wales along the Murray and Murrumbidgee rivers? I um, draw strength from you every day. Can I thank you, Peter, for your leadership to date and say that you are absolutely the best person for this job? And we have been colleagues and close friends for over 20 years. And I want to commend all of the work that you've done. You've been very modest in your self-assessment, but particularly your work on child safety, both behind the scenes and out there in the community. I want to say that I will continue to be a strong voice for rural and regional Australia. The Liberal Party brand uh, inspires me and is equally effective and belongs everywhere across our great country, whether it be in the cities or the bush. In fact, my hometown of Albury is where the Liberal Party was founded by Sir Robert Menzies. I will continue to be a strong voice for women. We know that we didn't receive the support of all women at the last election. And my message to the women of Australia is, we hear you. We heard you. We're listening. We're talking. 
and we are determined to earn back your trust and your faith. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis, you, you, not being a Labor light at the same time you've, you've lost those blue ribbon seats to, to the Teal candidates. Um, David Littleproud just said before you came on that the Nationals wouldn't support legislating um, emissions reduction targets along Labor's, Labor's lines. What, what's your instinct on that? I know you haven't had a party ring yet, but what's your sort of yeah, what's your initial instinct on where you'll go on climate? Uh, well, Phil, uh, first I want to say congratulations uh, to uh, the new leadership team in the Nationals. Uh, thank uh, Barnaby Joyce for his service and uh, Bridget McKenzie. But uh, David Littleproud is somebody that I've worked very closely with, uh, obviously a fellow Queenslander and somebody who, for whom I have a great deal of respect. Uh, so we will work very closely together. The coalition is incredibly important and uh, the best prospect for us at the election is to have a tight coalition and uh, I dedicate myself to that. In terms of policy uh, on climate, uh, uh, I'm a very passionate believer in making sure that we have the appropriate uh, response to uh, the issue of, uh, of our emissions reductions. We need to do it in a sensible way. You know, for some Australians, uh, filling the car up at the moment for $2.10 a litre uh, is, you know, pretty exy when they get to, from the Bowser inside to pay, uh, but they can do it. Right? In many of the areas that uh, that we represent out in the suburbs, out in the regional communities, people are putting $20 and $40 of fuel in their car at the moment because they can't afford to fill it up. And similarly with their electricity bills. People will see an increase in electricity bills under Labor. Let's be very clear about that. Electricity prices under Labor will go up. And we have to have policies that help us meet our international obligations, which of course we will. We have to be responsible domestically in our own policy settings. And we have to be very mindful that people can afford in what will be a very difficult couple of years under Labor. And it's not just petrol and electricity, but their other cost of living uh, will go up as well. And so we'll have policies, we'll support policies which aren't going to turn lights off in small businesses, aren't going to send families broke in the suburbs because they can't afford Labor's power bill. And I also want to support domestic manufacturing. I want to make sure that we can provide support to those industries so that we don't see more jobs go offshore. And that will be uh, the guide rails, if you like, for the policies that, uh, that we'll have. And, uh, and I'll, just, I'll just finish the point. And, and we will have, uh, obviously, our shadow cabinet meeting. So this is day one of a three-year journey. We'll go through the party room and respect all of those processes uh, before we announce any change to that policy. I'll just, I'll just go across. We've got plenty of time. Yep. Um, you said you regretted walking out on the apology to the stolen generations. Does that now mean you'll be more open to supporting the Uluru Statement of the Heart? Very, very happy to speak with uh, the government. As I, I note, Linda Burney in the last couple of days has said that they're still working through the detail of what they're likely to propose, so we'll wait for that detail. Uh, I made a mistake uh, in relation to the apology, and largely that was because of my own background and experience. Uh, many of you have lived out in regional areas, and many of you haven't. Uh, I worked uh, in Townsville. Uh, I remember going to many domestic violence instances, uh, particularly involving Indigenous communities. And for me, uh, at the time, I believe that the apology should be given when the problems were resolved and the problems are not resolved. There are little boys and girls in parts of our country in 2022, in this year, that slept in a shipping container last night to get through the hours of darkness in Indigenous communities, and it's completely unacceptable. Now, governments, our government, uh, the Morrison government, uh, back through Rudd Gillard for many years, I think we've all been on a unity ticket to do as much as we can to improve uh, the condition in local communities, the advancement of Aboriginal people in our country, education, health outcomes, closing the gap, all the rest of it. But we have all failed. And so, yes, I. I, I understand the symbolism and I made that mistake, but for me it came from a place uh, where I, I just find it unbearable to think that those little kids are facing that situation or women are facing significantly higher domestic violence circumstances uh, and realities in those communities. So I want there to be practical solutions and I want to work with the government to deliver those. But I want them to work hand in glove. You know, going to a meeting here in Canberra and giving 10 acknowledgements to country, that's fine. And I don't say that in a disparaging way. I want to know how it is we're going to support those kids. 
and how it is that we're going to get higher uh, uh, health outcomes and uh, infant mortality rates, uh, more kids through university just to finish primary school and secondary school to start with. Uh, and that's, that's the perspective that I bring to it. Mr Darcy, you, uh, you, you and Scott Morrison went out pretty hard on the China issue. The evidence appears to be that you lost the votes of Chinese Australians. If you look at some of the seats that were lost, you went pretty close to accusing uh, people on the Labor front bench of treason, almost. Are you going to attempt to temper some of that language or there's no backing down? You're still going to go hard on, on the China issue? Andrew, I, I have uh, had the benefit of uh, the briefings uh, in the National Security Committee and obviously at a higher level uh, in some circumstances as Defence Minister. The issue of China under President Xi is the biggest issue our country will face in our lifetimes. That's the reality. That's the assessment of the Americans, of the British, of the Japanese, of the Indians, and it's uh, our assessment as well. I will support uh, policies which help to defend our country, so decisions uh, made by uh, the new government in relation to uh, rolling out AUKUS, which was an incredible achievement of the Morrison government, and other policies which will help keep us safe. I spoke up uh, firstly in relation to 5G and other issues because on the 5G issue I didn't want in an environment where we would have autonomous vehicles and remote monitoring of health devices for our telecommunication system to be compromised. I don't want interference in our electoral outcomes. I don't want there to be threats on university campuses. I want us to have a productive relationship with China. I want it to be restored, but that is an issue for China. Now, uh, I've made strong statements in the past and I don't resolve from those because I feel very passionately about including this issue. Including about Labor front benches? I, in, including you about... Uh, yeah, I, I, you don't think they're acting in Australia's interests or will? I, I, I believe uh, very strongly that we can work together with the government, and I've made this clear uh, before and uh, I'll repeat it again now. We will, we will support good policy. We will oppose Labor's bad policy. Uh, but I can tell you from all that I've seen, uh, the risk continues to compound. China has been very clear about their intent in relation to Taiwan. Uh, you're seeing the reality now on the ground. And you know, the final point is that Labor has promised at the last election that they would resolve these issues. Penny Wong said that she's going to take a different approach and that she'll address the issues uh, and that we won't see the continued uh, ag aggression or the signing of these agreements within uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I'll be happy to pay on uh, on outcome, but I suspect uh, we'll be talking about this for a while. Mr. Dutton, Mr. Dutton. Uh, your deputy Susan Lee was saying before that uh, she believes that the coalition lost the trust of voters. What's your theory on that? And secondly, uh, that the lead in the in the, your personal saddlebags is this rigid um, uh, attitude that some voters might have about you. What have they got wrong about you? Well, why don't I let Susan just? repeat what she actually did say and then I'll, uh, and then I'll be happy to, happy to come to you. Um, Andrew, that is respectfully a mischaracterisation. However, I do acknowledge that there were women who did not support us that may have supported us previously. There were many women that did, including in my electorate where there was general happiness with the government's performance. So what we need to do in the analysis that's already underway of the results of the federal election is look at that issue. because. It may be booth by booth, community by community. There, is so, there are so many different stories to be told. And my message is that we're listening, that we heard the notes of disappointment amongst the notes of endorsement. We're listening and we're ready to meet you and discuss the issues that matter. Uh, Andrew, we, we've uh, initiated a review, which uh, Brian Lochnane is going to lead uh, for the Liberal Party along with uh, Jane Hume and others. And we'll wait for, for that response. But, um, I want to give you this assurance. Uh, we've heard uh, a message loud and clear from the Australian public. Uh, we were a government of nine years. The last couple of years have been some of the most dramatic, uh, certainly that I've experienced in my 20 years in public life. Uh, the reality of COVID, uh, the way in which that's impacted uh, on the Australian psyche and uh, the response to it uh, through JobKeeper, for example, where we saved over 700,000 jobs. Uh, there are policies that uh, were strongly endorsed by the Australian people and others that they weren't happy with. Uh, but we've gone through difficult times as a country over the last couple of years. I hope that's in the past, but I think there are economic headwinds uh, that will be a reality over the next couple of years, and you don't know what happens with the next variant, etc. Uh, in relation to the other part of your question, 
Uh, I, I've, had, uh, I've been given tough jobs uh, as, as a minister. It was difficult to, in the Home Affairs portfolio bringing that together, um, but ultimately I was able to cancel uh, the visas of about six, just over 6,000 criminals, people who had committed sexual offences against women and children, people who had committed murder, serious criminal acts otherwise, and to deport them from our country. Now, pretty hard to break into a smile when you're up there making that announcement. Uh, I was Defence Minister and we were able to negotiate with the United States the AUKUS deal and to deal with the other issues and the realities uh, of the withdrawal of uh, over 4,000 people out of Kabul, uh, one of the proudest achievements. So the work that we did in bringing people from Syria, from war-torn Syria into our country, uh, the Yazidi women who were being tortured, raped, enslaved and butchered by ISIL. Uh, we brought those people here under my watch. But again, it's hard to to talk about all of that without you know, um, showing a softer side or showing a different side to your character. And all I would say is that I'm not going to change, but I want people to see the entire person that I am. And I want people to reserve and make their own judgments when they meet me. I've been in a community now, in a Labor, Labor, uh, uh, nationally Labor electorate. Um, I've won that, election, that electorate eight times in a row. Um, and people on the ground can see in a you know, more wholesome way who I am. Um, you know, hopefully you could tell a different story that I'm not as bad as the ABC sometimes might report. Uh, but well, there was a smile. There was, uh, there was, the ABC always brings a smile to my face. So, uh, <laughs> yes, well, yeah. Would you still characterise the Billawilla children as anchor babies? I, I have uh, a couple of points uh, that I, I think are worth making. I mean, there are hundreds of cases where I acted on grounds of compassion in relation to migration cases. Uh, I think the Minister for Immigration is one of the most difficult jobs in the government. One of the things, though, that I didn't have when I was the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection and Home Affairs uh, were calls at two and three o'clock in the morning uh, from the Admiral telling me that a boat had listed and that women and children had drowned. And I was conscious of that because I've spoken to men and women of the Australian Defence Force, the Australian Navy in particular, and they are still suffering from PTSD, PTSD today because of that policy failure when Labor was last in government. So I wish, I wish the family well. I have nothing, no, no gripe against the family. I have no gripe against the, uh, the family. Um, and as I say, I acted compassionately in hundreds of cases which weren't in the media. Now, the thing that we've got to be careful about is that the people smugglers who are evil, they trade in gun parts, in drugs, uh, in human beings, if they think they're back in business or they're hearing messages from the Australian government that there's an opening for them and that they can pitch to people, if you wait long enough, you'll be able to get onto a boat and come to Australia, then that will be tragic. Uh, now, we were able to bring people here in record numbers through the Refugee and Humanitarian Program in a responsible and measured way. Uh, I uh, want to make sure that we don't um, see the tragedy of uh, kids in detention. We got all of the children out of detention. Uh, I don't want to see uh, the boats restart, uh, and I do want to see a generous refugee and humanitarian project. Yes, Catherine. Uh, if, if I can just get this a little bit more clearly. Yes. Um, you've spoken quite a bit about the outer suburbs and the regions mm -hmm. uh, over the last couple of days. Do you think, in order to win government, that you, as the Liberal leader, will have to win back Kuyong, North Sydney, uh, Wentworth, those seats, or do you think that you have a pathway to victory without those seats? And if I may, one for Susan. Um, I, I've heard what you said about women, but I don't entirely know what you mean. So could you give me some specifics about what you mean by that signal? Okay. Uh, uh, to win the next election, uh, we, we're not going to abandon any seat. Uh, our policies are going to be targeted uh, at those people who understand that the Liberal Party is the best when it comes to economic management so that we can pay for our climate change investment so that we can pay for education and policing and our roads and infrastructure. Uh, all of those issues that, uh, that are important to people, um, they're shared commonly in the capital cities and in the suburbs. All I want to do is to make sure, though, that we don't forget about those in the suburbs, and I do think they are the forgotten people. I do think those people in small business and micro business feel that the system is against them. And I want to be a voice for them. I want to make sure that we can help them, that we can see their businesses grow into big businesses. I think the Liberal Party in recent years, frankly, has become quite estranged from big business. And I want to focus on small business. 
I want that to be the focus of our policies. I want to have strong policies, and we'll be talking more about that. Um, so I'm not giving up on any seat, um, but I do want to send a very clear message to those in the suburbs, particularly those in seats where there's been a swing against the Labor Party on their primary. In many parts of the country, this election was a pox on both your houses. There's huge hesitation around Anthony Albanese as to whether he's up to this job. Now, people will give him a go, rightly, they've just voted for him, and the, he'll be in a honeymoon period, the media will, will give him that, that's the, the convention. But people did have a huge doubt about whether they would vote for him, and in some cases, in many seats, right across the country, the primary vote went down under Mr Albanese's leadership. So uh, I think we've all got a lot of work to do. There's a lot to listen to uh, out of this uh, uh, election, and um, I'm going to be putting all of that into action over the course of the next three years. Susan. Um, thank you, Catherine. The time following any election loss is a time for sober reflection, as of course it should be. And also, sometimes women are presented as one homogenous group, which clearly they're not, and every woman has their own passions, their own drives, their own determination, their own wishes for themselves, their children and their families. So to collect them in one group and say these things apply, these don't, this went wrong, this didn't, um, would be you know, far too presumptuous. My message is that I do know that there were women who abandoned the coalition at the last election and there were women who firmly supported us. So at this point in time, as the review takes place, I will be travelling to as many parts of Australia to speak directly to the women to hear their individual perspectives about what matters to them. But I also know that the coalition's strong focus on women's economic security and women's safety, record investments that we made over the term of the last government, uh, will stand us in good stead and set us up for those future conversations. We're not ignoring the side. I'll come, I'll come across in a second. We've got plenty of time. Yes, the issues that the Labor Party ran very clearly on in what was a relatively small target campaign was a federal ICAC, uh, the establishment of one, and a move to 43% emissions reductions by 2030. On those two specific issues, will the Liberal Party back the government, given it seems to have I think a fairly reasonable or mandate for it. And secondly, when will you name your front bench and do you anticipate many changes to it? Um, toward, toward the end of this week and uh, you'll see then how many changes I'll make to it. Uh, it look, in, in terms of uh, policies more generally, as I say, we'll uh, make announcements once we go through our process. Uh, and I, I dealt with the emissions uh, question earlier. But on, on the ICAC, uh, I'm a strong supporter of the ICAC. Uh, I believe in transparency. And I always have. Uh, I think one of the greatest things that happened uh, post the Fitzgerald inquiry era in Queensland was that there was uh, continuing scrutiny, which I think has uh, stood our state in good stead. It's not the case in every state around the country uh, where you know, I think there are issues and I think um, the commissions have worked with varying success. Uh, as so well, I. I'll just, I'll just make, make, make this point. So I, I, I believe very much in the transparency. The reason that I think uh, it's more important than ever is that under this Labor government, under the Albanese government, we are going to have uh, a continuation of this unholy alliance with the CFMEU, the ETU, the MUA and the Labor Party. Don't forget, in states around the country, we've seen uh, red shirts in Victoria, we've seen in Queensland where ministers are keeping secret second email accounts to take direction from union bosses. So I welcome the scrutiny. I think it's, I think it's a good thing. Uh, the nuance and the detail, uh, we'll be able to work through that. Uh, and I'm keen to engage with Helen Haynes, uh, for whom I have a great deal of respect, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Mr. 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 The Greens have four seats in the lower house. Three yes. of those they won. It's very Queensland. unfortunate, isn't it? If it's not with tougher climate policy, how do you plan on countering the rise of the Greens in Queensland? And one for Susan, if I can. You say you're listening to female voters. How then do you explain keeping two men at the helm of the coalition? Well, in, look, in relation to, uh, to the Greens, I, I think both parties, frankly, are going to have to talk more about what the Greens represent. Uh, and the Greens aren't... Uh, you know, this environmental movement that uh, believes in, you know, particular policies. Uh, they believe in halving the defence spending in this country. 
Uh, they believe in all sorts of radical plans, uh, which I don't think most Australians would support. And to be honest, in the analysis that I've done of a number of our seats and a number of seats where Labor's been in trouble, or in the case of Griffith, where they've lost that seat to Labor, uh, to the, from Labor to the Greens, I think there is as much a protest vote there as a vote for the Greens. And I would be surprised if that holds up over the next three years. I think there is, uh, frankly, as I said before, uh, people weren't uh, happy with us uh, in the end, that's clear. Uh, they weren't that enamoured with Mr Albanese. And I think many of them have sent a protest vote through the Greens. And we, we will talk more about that. Chris. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, well, I would simply answer your point by saying there are many women in leadership positions across the parliament and every woman in our parties has that leadership role and will be part of all of the policies and the perspectives that will come in due course. Uh, but also make the very clear point that while women speak for women, they also speak for other issues of concern, and while men speak for a variety of topics, they also speak for women. So uh, I'm very comfortable with the leadership of our party, and I'm very comfortable with Peter Dutton in the role and his understanding as he has um, outlined today. Sorry, Chris, yeah. Liberal Party representing the suburbs and the regions of forgotten people. Are you now claiming that the Liberal Party represents the working class? I think, uh, as we've seen quite remarkably, just in the first week of this government, uh, the break of faith with the working people of Australia. Anthony Albanese gave absolute clarity during the campaign that he would support uh, a 5.1 per cent increase that he would write to the Fair Work Commission, and he broke that promise. Now he's tried to be—he's he's, you know tried to be clever with it uh, in making the announcement uh, in the days before the leadership vote has taken place in the Liberal Party or our front bench. Uh, is, uh, is, is announced. Um, so he's, he's tried to do it uh, on a Friday afternoon under the cover of darkness and I think he should be called out for it because I think it is a monumental breach of trust with those workers who heard him say that he would support them in a 5.1 per cent wage increase and he hasn't. He's walked away from them. So I believe uh, that the Liberal Party uh, in its current form and certainly under my leadership uh, will be much better for working families, for workers for workers right across the country. Uh, and I'm going to make sure uh, that people understand that. We have a great story to tell, and I'm going to champion policies uh, within our shadow cabinet, within our party room, directly targeting those workers, because those workers in many seats have walked away from Labor. Is this the record that is probably still going to be a major concern for the population in the next three years. Are you proposing any sort of fiscal or economic reform moving forward, and if so, what will it look like? Well, well, it will. Uh, we will. But if you forgive me, I'm not going to announce it today on day one, uh, which you might uh, cut me that slack. Um, the, the government, uh, the Treasurer and the Finance Minister are out at the moment uh, saying effectively that they don't know what to do. Uh, now, they had, under the Charter of Budget Honesty and under PFO, the numbers in front of them. They knew exactly what they were inheriting. They made policy decisions based on all of that. They're now into government telling you that they didn't understand the numbers and that they've got a policy agenda which is not properly funded. And so now you've got S&P and others talking about whether Australia's credit rating is going to be adversely affected. Well, frankly, they've had years in opposition to work out what policies they could afford and what they can't. But Labor always spends more than what they can afford to spend. And Labor will always tax as a result of it. And it will be at exactly the wrong time over the course of the next few years, where I think it is going to be difficult for families and for small businesses under Labor. I think we should be very clear about that. Uh, WA Premier Mark McGowan has described you as not that smart and an extremist. How do you react to that? And how do you plan to win back WA after losing so many seats in the election? Well, I, I feel uh, a great affinity with WA. As a, as a Queenslander, uh, as much as anything, there's always as sort of two mining states and two states with uh, you know, vast regional areas, I think there's always been that affinity with uh, WA and Queensland. So I feel at home in WA, frankly, as I do around the rest of the country. I've, in this job, travelled to uh, you know, Sydney hundreds of times, uh, dozens and dozens of times to uh, other capital cities, uh, including Perth, and I've got lots of friends in WA. Um, I've got respect for Mark Gowan as the Premier for WA. I'm not going to enter into a tit-for-tat and juvenile comments. Uh, the State Premiers 
uh, state Labor premiers and chief ministers lined up as one to attack and to pull down Scott Morrison. They'll seek to do the same with me. Uh, all I'd say to the Australian people is to uh, look at me and form your own judgment, uh, listen to what I'm saying and form your own judgment, uh, as opposed to listening to these politically motivated statements. Uh, and in relation to you know, the second part of his, his comment, um, uh, well, I uh, have a bachelor's degree uh, in business, uh, in public administration. Uh, I wasn't a committed student uh, at school. I was more interested in making money, I might say. Uh, and I started a business of nothing uh, into a very significant business employing 40 staff. Uh, I've been on the front bench of the Liberal Party since 2004, having been identified by John Howard in my first term as being capable of being appointed very quickly to the ministry. Uh, I've served as our country's uh, health minister, uh, sport, which was a great portfolio. Um, I've been the defence minister, the home affairs minister. Uh, I've been on the expenditure review committee. I've been a part of the national security committee, as I say, uh, and as part of the leadership uh, of the party. Um, I'll let people draw their own conclusions as to what my capacity is. Yeah. 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 It's looking like Prime Minister Albanese will at best form a majority <coughs> government with a very slim majority. Uh, we also have a very large crossbench. What is your plan to approach the crossbench members, including a lot of the new independent MPs who obviously occupy seats once held by the Liberals? Do you foresee being able to forge a relationship and potentially vote with them on certain issues? Well, yes, uh, as a short answer. Uh, as a uh, leader in the House, I uh, tried to have a very productive relationship and a respectful relationship with the independents. And I th think you've seen some public commentary uh, that reflects that uh, from the independents. And, and I'll continue to do that. Um, there'll be issues that we can agree on, that we disagree on. Uh, but in the chamber, you'll be able to work out who are real independents and who are green independents. And that will become obvious uh, by people's voting patterns, by their statements. and. Uh, their comments on broader issues and what has just been examined uh, during the course of the election. So uh, th there is an opportunity to work constructively. I suspect if the government doesn't get uh, a majority in the lower house, uh, then they will ask Mr Wilkie uh, to be the speaker. Uh, I suspect uh, Mr Wilkie or one of the other independents would be prepared to do that. Uh, so that, that's how I think they will shore up their position uh, in the lower house and then of course in the Senate, well the Labor Party will be relying on the Greens uh, to get their agenda through and uh, that will be an interesting experiment which I think will drag the Labor Party further to the left. Mr. Dutton, Mr. Dutton, Mr. Dutton thank you. You mentioned um, in response to an earlier question about the Liberal Party being estranged from big business. Mm. Is that a relationship that you're eager to repair or, or do you think it's one that you can sort of jettison in part of this? pursuit of votes in the suburbs and, 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 and region, region, regional areas. And secondly, just on the policy front, super for housing, is that something that you will keep going forward for the Liberal Party or is that up for review or is it dead? What's the sort of thinking? Well, I, I, I don't uh, seek an adversarial relationship uh, with, with big business, not at all. I work uh, closely with, uh, with every Australian. and. Uh, my focus, though, is on small business, and our policies will be targeted towards small and micro businesses. Uh, the, you know, the single mum who's at home with an online business, uh, the couple who have uh, a business that's been created out of COVID, uh, uh, people who have lost their jobs and now working to build up their business again, uh, they're the people that I'll be targeting. And uh, I want people to, to understand and to know that. that uh, as you move around the shopping strips and as you see, you know, little sort of tilt concrete slab sheds in industrial parks where they're exporting $5 million worth of Australian product each year, um, they're the ones. I, I want to support them to become bigger businesses. Um, so we'll, we'll have a cordial relationship with uh, big business and, and we'll work uh, on that. But I think a lot of, frankly, CEOs now are closer to uh, the other parties than they are to the Liberal Party. I think that's the modern reality and uh, I, I don't seek estrangement from them, but we'll work very closely with them. Um, but I want to create jobs. I want to have a robust economy and with the damage that I think Labor will do over the next few years, um, we'll have a big job when we return to government in 2025. Sorry, I'll just come back to housing. Um, well, our, our policies are as we took to the election and then uh, if we've got a change in the policies, we'll um, we'll have a look at those, um, but home ownership, you know, first home ownership is, is a huge issue. It was, you know, when all of us bought our first homes, it's even harder now because of 
the price increases, uh, the cost of money obviously is cheaper than it was uh, perhaps when we all bought, bought our first homes, but uh, interest rates are likely to go up and uh, there will be real pressure in, the, in those markets. A lot of people want to live as close to the city as possible or as close to the coastline. Um, so there are different policies that, uh, that we can include, but I, I'm not philosophically opposed to a policy that allows uh, young people to access their superannuation, to invest in an asset class which is their own home, given that under the rules supported by the Labor Party and the Coalition they can invest into an investment property where they rent that property out, but providing that they're required to put that investment back into their superannuation. So you're not missing out on the compounding benefit of that by the time you retire. And the Labor Party is opposed to it because the influence of the industry funds and the union people within the industry funds is phenomenal and it's worth more examination. But I'm not opposed to people being able to get into uh, home ownership because otherwise at the other end it means that you're still renting or you've got a huge mortgage and the first two or three or four hundred dollars a week of your pension or of your superannuation is going toward either a mortgage repayment or uh, to, to rent. So uh, I think home ownership, uh, if we'd allowed people to access their super five years ago or 15 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, when you see what property prices have done in our country, uh, they'd be sitting on a fortune in terms of the equity that they'd have in their own home, but also within their super funds. So I'm not opposed to allowing Australians to achieve uh, what is you know, a great dream and it will continue to be and it should be because it's a good investment to make and um, I hope that we can support that. Just, just, just on, your, on your pitch to the suburbs, mm. um, your party in this election didn't pick up any seats in the suburbs. In fact, it really only just lost them. Um, many people in, in suburban or, areas... Or we, in, or we held them. Yes, or, to, or, or to you held fair. them. Very, yes. very fair. Yeah. Um, but many people in those outer suburban regions are from multicultural backgrounds, given that for a number of years as Home Affairs Minister and Immigration Minister, you have essentially been the face of the Liberal Party in terms of that hard stance on borders and, and immigration. How are you going to appeal to those multicultural communities, given that that has you know, essentially been, been your, your thing for, for the last number of years? Well, again, I just ask people to look at my track record, not, not what some within the media or within the Labor Party want that track record to be. I bought in Yazidi women uh, and I'm proud of it. I remember going to New South Wales uh, and the emotion of those families, uh, their sisters, their cousins, their mothers, their daughters had been enslaved, as I said before, and brutally raped and murdered. And we saved a record number of those women, probably on a per capita basis, more than any other country in the world. The Syrians that we brought in, uh, young families uh, that I met in Jordan, uh, incredibly emotional. They will all be wonderful Australians. As I said in my opening remarks, the great migrant story of our country is one to be celebrated. Uh, but we do, in this country, have a lot on offer. We're a population of 25.8 million people. There are 84 million people in the world today who would want to come here. And we have to have an orderly transition and orderly movement of people for those to come here uh, and to start the life that many generations have been able to start before. I think on the, um, the, the question of multicultural com communities more generally, um, I do want us to engage more with multicultural communities. Uh, and I want us to celebrate uh, and to continue to celebrate. And we are, I've said time and time again in relation to uh, people of Chinese heritage in our country, in our country the most amazing migrant story. Look at Indian families who uh, are today's millionaires, you know, tomorrow's billionaires in our country because uh, we're just a couple of generations ahead of where they are um, because their forebears, you know, made a different decision than, than ours. And I want them to continue to succeed. I want to celebrate the Chinese success story, the Indian success story, that every country around the world we've been able to attract people here because we're a wonderful country. And we want to keep our country great, and we will. Uh, so I do want to celebrate more that migrant story and uh, to tell the complete picture of what I've been able to do to contribute toward that. And in relation to border protection policy, I've got to say, in my engagement with multicultural communities, many of them are the hardest uh, when it comes to keeping our borders secure because the way that they want their families to be here uh, and to reunite with them, they don't want that place taken by somebody uh, who's come here uh, illegally. That's uh, 
that's the reality. Mr. Dutton, the Liberals lost around 17 seats at this election. Is it your instinct that you lost based on the policy offerings that were put forward, or was it the salesman Scott Morrison? And what lessons have you learnt from Scott Morrison's leadership as Prime Minister? Well, we've gone through uh, the last couple of years, as I say, uh, almost unprecedented, certainly in a health sense, uh, probably for a century. Uh, I remember coming back from Washington uh, in uh, you know, late February, early March, uh, whatever it was, uh, uh, 2020, and people were scared. I mean, there was no vaccine. People didn't know what this meant, particularly for older Australians. Uh, the United States had all sorts of problems with cruise ships. Uh, there were great difficulties. And you know, to the Prime Minister's, to Prime Minister Morrison's credit, he was able to deal with that. And we took a decision to close the border with China, which, in my judgment, was the decision that really saved us from the European. Uh, or uh, Asian experience uh, or what we saw in Africa and elsewhere around the world. I think we saved tens of thousands of lives and I was there listening to the advice and the options and they weren't great options and the advice was confronting. Uh, we had uh, policies that saved small businesses. Small businesses in this country in the tens of thousands would have gone broke without JobKeeper. And whenever I move around the country, people that have benefited from that, workers and bosses alike, acknowledge that. Now, there are lessons out of the uh, election. We've initiated this process. Uh, we'll see what that comes back with. We'll respond appropriately to it. But uh, under my leadership, the Liberal Party uh, is not, as I said before, not the Conservative Party, not the moderate party. We are Liberals. Uh, we are a broad church. Uh, we will have policies that appeal uh, to Australians across the board, those Australians that believe as I do, that we need to keep our country safe and to keep the economy strong so that we can help families and help small businesses and uh, help them grow. Mr. Dutton, yeah. so can I go back on the, you talk about CEOs being more aligned with the other parties nowadays than the Liberal Party. Is, is that not just them acknowledging public sentiment and having to follow through their ESG commitments? And is it something perhaps the Coalition has, has not picked up on that, you know, public attitudes are changing. You've got to be more that way on some issues. Phil, I'm not, I'm not critical of that. I'm critical of the, the absence of voices, strong voices, that we would have seen uh, a, even a decade ago, but within the last generation of business leaders in our country who was happy to speak out on, uh, on different uh, economic policies. Um, nobody's advocating for uh, changes around uh, industrial relations or wages policy or uh, in relation to economic policy or taxation policy more generally. And I think we're a poorer country for that. I think many of them are uh, probably scared to step up because they're worried of uh, an onslaught by Twitter and they're, they're living in that environment. And uh, I hope that, uh, that we can continue to work with them, but I need them to, to speak up on all sorts of policies, not just social policies, um, but other economic policies, not just climate change, uh, as important as all those policies are. Where are they on taxation reform? We've got huge leakage uh, in our system with online transactions, etc. There, there are many things that we should be talking about as a nation, and I hope that we can uh, initiate some of those policy discussions over the next three years. Mr. Yeah. Earlier, you previously argued that a um, Indigenous voice in Parliament would be uh, would amount to a third chamber. Are you open to supporting a referendum on enshrining a, a voice to Parliament, or is that something you would campaign against? Well, the. The, the Minister, uh, uh, Linda Burney, has stated, as I said before, that she's not yet settled in her own mind, I think, uh, and certainly I don't think it's been through the caucus in the Labor Party as to what the final form will be. So we'll, we'll have a look at what they're proposing. Um, but as I said, I, I, I want uh, the, the symbolic nature, which I, I accept uh, is very important to many people, to be accompanied by practical responses. I want to understand how we're going to reduce the incidence of child abuse within those in, within those communities. I want to understand how it is that we're going to allow more young girls to go on to education, how we can address infant mortality and, and many other indicators. Uh, and as I say, it's not been from a bad place, but our, we've failed in this policy area and nobody hand on heart can sit here today and say that we are in a better position in many of those uh, instances, uh, many of those indicators, than we were five or 10 or 25 years ago. So I, I want to understand what it leads to and how we can be constructive in helping uh, Indigenous Australians also celebrate the great successes. I believe this in the, in the defence space as well. We have to take care of those who are suffering from PTSD 
You have to take care of those who have incurred uh, the, 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 you know, the injuries from conflict, etc. But we also need to celebrate the great success stories. You look at some of the, uh, the Supreme Court appointment uh, in Queensland, the Indigenous business people, uh, the people within Indigenous communities uh, who are giving back in a philanthropic way to you know, their birthplace. I mean, all of that is something that we should celebrate as well as addressing um, the reality because you know, people are falling further and further behind. And it seems remote if you're living in Canberra, to be honest, uh, because the Northern Territory and Queensland in particular uh, is a long way away. And well, I think we need to spend more time in these communities. Would you like to see okay. the GST removed from power bills? You said that when you ran for the leadership last time. Would you like to see that as a priority? No, no, I don't. But I, I do want to see policies. Uh, and I said I'd be happy to look at, uh, at that uh, in 2018. But I don't advocate uh, that position. I think we need to uh, understand from the government. I mean, the government uh, has just been elected. Uh, the policy uh, that they're going to take to the Australian people needs to be understood because uh, Anthony Albanese hasn't properly explained how high power prices will go and how unreliable the energy source will become. And I can tell you, when you speak to business people here and overseas, <laughs> those who want to invest into our country, those that are thinking about taking their investment offshore, they are worried about those exact issues. And I think uh, those problems are only going to exacerbate uh, under under Labor. Is Angus Taylor going to be your shadow treasurer? Well, Andrew, you are a patient person, uh, <laughs> and you only have to wait until later this week to find out who all of the appointments will be, and uh, I'll be able to announce it then. Should Australia still be preparing for war? Well, Australia should be realistic about uh, what's happening with China under President Xi, and the Prime Minister has made this point, and they've been very clear about their intent in relation to Taiwan. I'm concerned that if they went into Taiwan, that would change quite dramatically the security settings within our own region. I think it would impact negatively on the trading uh, relationships that we have with our neighbours and what it means for uh, safe passage of uh, vessels through uh, particular straits and uh, all the approaches to our country as well. Uh, and I, I quoted, uh, I think, a fifth century proverb maybe uh, at the time, um, which was uh, uh, you know, not, not too controversial. That is that you've got to, as a country, be strong. And I want to be a strong country. As I said before, we live in the best country in the world. It's worth fighting for. It's worth making sure that we take the decisions to help people uh, and to clean up Labor's mess in three years' time. Uh, they are going to be a bad government. There's no doubt in my mind about that. They don't have the experience or the capability and already their economic team is falling apart. The Prime Minister's already made his first broken promise and he looked Australian workers in the eye and he misled them during the campaign. They say the submission will say that the, the, those on the minimum wage shouldn't go behind. That's the same thing, isn't it? That's committing to the rate of inflation. Andrew, if you look at uh, the words of the Prime Minister, his response was absolutely. Right? I don't know how you duck and weave around that. Well, isn't that uh, absolutely? It's, it, it was absolutely that he would write to uh, and, and provide uh, you know, instruction almost as Prime Minister. I mean, that was the imprimatur that, that, and the impression that he gave. And he hasn't done that. Well, do you support uh, I, Do you support No, I support the tradition of uh, the Coalition and the Labor government before that, uh, who set up the Fair Work Commission to allow the Fair Work Commission to look at all of the economic indicators uh, and to look at uh, the prevailing conditions, what's likely to happen around the corner and uh, to, support, uh, to support workers. I want to do that, but I don't want to drive inflation up like Mr Albanese is proposing to. And something's happened uh, since election day because for him to break such a significant promise, uh, that, is, that is a very big deal. And the Labor Party has already broken faith with the Australian people. Yes, Catherine, um, is there any prospect <laughs> this term? Sounds like not from what you're saying, but is there any prospect in this term that the Liberal and Labor parties could reach an alignment on climate policy? Catherine, as I said before, I take the issue very seriously. Uh, I've supported uh, our policies in the, in the past. I've looked at countries that have made commitments and never met them. Uh, we have made commitments, we've met them. Uh, so I'm, I'm very supportive of serious policy, uh, but I want us to get the balance right. And if you look at what's happening in Europe at the moment, uh, my, my, my job as the opposition leader is to put policies forward uh, between now and the next election and to hold the bad government to account. Um, that's, that's, that's my job. And we'll support policies that aren't going to crush families and small businesses. And I'm worried at the moment the Labor Party policies 
uh, as they've got make energy less reliable and more expensive. And families at the moment can't afford that because they can't afford to fill their car. They're seeing grocery prices go up. They know that uh, their rents are going up or that interest rates, if they go up, that they'll have to pay more in their mortgage. And they are worried. Uh, and I don't want to make that situation worse for them. Uh, I want to help their families and I want to help their small businesses become uh, bigger businesses. And uh, I, I worry that the Labor Party is embarking on a course where they will tax and spend and it'll be those families and those small businesses that will be uh, adversely impacted. Okay, Thank yeah. You. That's your last one. I think yeah. everyone's all done. Okay. Um, so many multicultural and minority communities, including the disabled community and the LGBTIQ community, mm -hmm. feel underrepresented, underrepresented by um, some of the Liberal policies and the Liberal Party itself. Um, what's your message for them to know that they do? that you will represent those people? Well, I, I hope that uh, they can look at our, our broad suite of policies uh, designed to help people not discriminate against anyone. I hope that next time they can support Trevor Evans in the seat of Brisbane uh, because he was a great member, a great minister, and I hope uh, he'll be the next member for Brisbane as well because uh, he really worked incredibly hard on the ground. I hope that people in the next election can tra support Trent Zimmerman uh, in North Sydney because he was a good local member worked hard for his local community and uh, I hope that we can support, uh, hope that they can support uh, candidates across the board because uh, ultimately whatever program it is that we want to provide uh, to the community, we have to be able to pay for it. And if we don't run the economy well, we don't manage the budget well, you can't pay for it. And that's exactly what Labor's about to find out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.